Howdy, folks. Howdy ho! We're here with another episode of Twists. That's right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't the, have what? I would never mind. I'm like, aren't you quoting a little? Never, never. Yes. Never mind. Um, we are, yeah, we're here to do another episode of Twist. It's episode 406 today, and we have no music because my Onyx Mackie mixer that was supposed to be super awesome doesn't work with Max really well. No Max for Mackie. It just. I'm starting so to not like your. Uh... Oh. Yeah. So if anybody wants to buy a nice Mackionix mixer for around five hundred dollars or so, lightly used, you know, uh, it really sucks. I'll send it in the original. But you might like it. I don't know. <laughs> That's the worst outfit. <laughs> right. I got this thing. And this is horrible. Worst car I've ever owned. But, it doesn't uh, work for me. Like driving it. I don't know. It really didn't. It's horrible. It didn't really work. I need to get. I need to get Justin to sell things for me. But anyway, um, I have a question before we start the actual show. Okay. Um, I meant to ask you this off air, but I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> um, do you want me to try wait, now wait, that wait, I wait, have wait, wait. internet? If this is, you can just message me later. It's okay. The answer is going to be no. I'm sorry, but still. Aww. Uh, you can, you can, Really? After I wish. all we've been through? No, I know. It's just it's complicated. It's um, this thing. But it's so embarrassing. I can't believe oh, you're doing boy. this on the air. Yeah. That's, oh, wow. <laughs> you think you do it on the air. You can't be turned down, but I was just so wrong. I'm sorry. So I just, wrong. Before you got it all the way out, I wanted to you know, make sure. It Put it back in. Put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, so this is my actual question. Since I have internet awesome. in the same country as you guys, um, I'm thinking it's going to work better again. Hopefully. Like, like the good old days. So yes. I'm wondering if I want to attempt to do show notes during like I used to or if not. Uh, yeah. Do you some can, typing. If you, if you want to, I mean, mute yourself while you type. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you'd like to, that would be awesome. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll try. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. We shall see how it goes. Mm -hmm. If not, uh, then later, at least getting, like, find, links to things would yes. be great. I, th I think I'm going to try bare minimum to get links on there. That would be okay. helpful. Great. It was just, it was so difficult with the wonky other world internet. <laughs> it was impossible. Yeah. Wonky mm -hmm. Israeli internet. Mm -hmm. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, have you written a disclaimer, Justin? Yeah, I just, it's almost, uh, I'm actually, I'm doing the CAPTCHA thing. I want to go, I want to say hi to the chat room. Before. Ah. I've, tried, I've been trying to get in, but it's exceptionally. The they're machines writing, are beating you. Well, they're putting it in Swahili <laughs> now. I don't understand mm -hmm. the, I did the have characters to it that aren't times. even on my. They're not even on my my uh, keyboard here. Not see like Maybe none of this. Umlaut in there. I like umlauts. Some Hebrew, <laughs> accent aigu. Ooh, grave, accent uh -huh. grave. Uh -huh. <laughs> Circumflex. Circumflex. Oh, wait, wait. Right. Bien sûr. Uh, I keep hitting the reload button instead of the enter button. Maybe. <laughs> and then there's the cédille. <laughs> cédille. Oh, all these things I have oublied. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that was game college. set match right there. I think yeah. somebody's that was genius. Oh, I get... Is that better? Can you guys still hear me? I'm trying not to get the breathing on the microphone too much. It's a good, yes? Can you hear me clickety-clacking? Right now? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right.
this is going to the wrong place again. This is going to twist. This is is this going to the twist YouTube page today? Did I mess up? Is it going to the right place? Huh? I just huh? I just have to find out if we're broadcasting to the right place. People who are watching. Hey, yes. Because I didn't switch to the twist. Anyway, Google Plus is weird, so it. Awesome. Whew. Happiness. Right. We so I got the disclaimer. Now I just got to get some stories, and we'll be. <laughs> I think we can just dive in. I'll find it by the time. Dive it. Dive it. Name. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. Disclaimer. 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 The moment is rapidly approaching when the machinery of the body politic is poised to slash funding for a great many important research projects. Under the terms of the budget sequestration, National Science Foundation will lose a $2.5 billion in previously promised funding package. In the past, we've heard much about the private corporations being too big to fail. But what we fail to talk about is what exactly they would be failing out. By letting our scientific infrastructure fail, we fail at curing diseases, at unlocking new energy sources, new materials, and new technology that would do much more for our nation and the world than all the hedge funds on Earth ever intended to accomplish. It's maddening, to be sure, but no matter what cuts ensue, one thing will continue despite anything our government has to say about it. This Week in Science, coming up next. And there would be music if I had music. So we dance now. I'm leaning over. Oh, there's iTunes on my other little laptop. Is it going to play? No. Here, can you hear it? Good science to you, Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you, too, Justin. Happy Science Day. Woohoo! Happy Day of Science. Every day can be Science Day. It's true. It's really true. Just make it that way. And it is so. We have decreed it. Everybody, welcome, 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 welcome. This is This Week in Science. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed the... Um, uh, the interesting technology that we use to get the music to mm -hmm. you in today's podcast. It's retro. It's retro, that's right. There will be cut and paste in the editing, in the final edit it for sure. Oh, I've got a child. <laughs> oh, congratulations. <laughs> Kirsten, so she actually gave birth to a second child on the air without any... Oh, wait, no, that's the other one. That's the one you already had. Where'd okay. come from? No. All right. We're going to talk about science on the show today, not my uh, child birthing abilities. So, anyway, uh, what did I bring? I brought all sorts of science stories about trip trap. That's right, Kai. I brought stories about a crazy billionaire, the impending rat rebellion, and scientists bashing scientists. What did you bring, Justin? Oh my goodness, what do I have? Well, I'll be finding the stories by the time we're done. Oh, a supermassive black hole spinning nearly the speed of light? This is some crazy stuff. It's a little black hole, but it's moving really fast. Uh, we have a oh, shape changing uh, drugs making chemotherapy more effective. Good bacteria, uh, anti frost glasses, and camera and a football. Sounds pretty awesome, Blair. What'd you what'd you what'd you, what'd you bring? What's the animal well, corner? Have? I brought one doozy of a story about otter bacula. Don't know what a bacula is. Like Scott You'll be bacula, quantum maybe leap? not so surprised. <laughs> Google now. We'll talk about it later. Awesome! 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 All right, everybody, let's dig into the first science story of the show. Scientists bashing scientists. It's happening. It's happening. 
we don't like to hear about it, but it does happen occasionally. And this time, the bashing is uh, bashing on some pretty big news from last year. Do you guys remember uh, us reporting on the ENCODE project? Do you guys remember that at all? I don't remember. What was the ENCODE project? What did that entail? Yeah, so the ENCODE project is, uh, it was a, it's a consortium, consortium of researchers uh, the word ENCODE is an acronym that stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And it was aimed at basically looking at the human genome and starting to figure out which parts is which parts. And they came out with this massive pronunciation that, they came up with a huge pronunciation that 80% of our genome was functional. Whereas now we have an estimate of 10% being functional. Uh -oh. It's okay. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Wait, we only use 10% uh, of our DNA and 2% yes. of our brains? <laughs> right. So we've got a potential to be like, I don't know, how many, that's 50 times smarter and be in 10 places at once? <laughs> 10 yeah. places at once, that's right. So we... <laughs> We don't, we don't have a background filter today. Um, so anyway, the ENCODE project was, uh, it was big news. Science put it in its big end of year list. We talked about it in our big end of year list. It, it's huge. They, it, they, uh, they, in one paper, said that it, well, I don't know if they said it in paper or in a, an interview, but it was said by one of the researchers that science textbooks would have to be rewritten because junk DNA is not junk DNA. And we've had this idea for years and years that we only use 10% of, uh, of our genome, that only 10% is functional. And uh, their research said no. All right, so a few researchers looking into their work have come back and said, you guys are full of... <clears throat> Yeah, and so I just like to read to you from the uh, the abstract of this paper entitled "Genome uh, on the Immortality of Television Sets: Function in the Human Genome According to the Evolution Free Gospel of Encode." So that's the title of the paper, and according to the ab abstract. A recent slew of ENCODE consortium publications, specifically the article signed by all consortium members, put forward the idea that more than 80% of the human genome is functional. This claim flies in the face of current estimates according to which the fraction of the genome that is evolutionarily conserved through purifying selection, they mean uh, like natural selection, is under 10%. Thus, according to the ENCODE consortium, a biological function can be maintained indefinitely without selection, which implies that at least 80 minus 70 equals 70% 70 of the genome is perfectly invulnerable to deleterious mutations, either because no mutations can ever occur in these functional regions or because no mutations in these regions can ever be deleterious. This absurd conclusion was reached through various means, chiefly one, by employing the seldom used causal role definition of biological function and then applying it inconsistently to different biochemical properties. Two, by committing a logical fallacy known as affirming the consequent. Three, by failing to appreciate the crucial difference between junk DNA and garbage DNA. Four, by using analytical methods that yield biased errors and inflate estimates of functionality, five, by favoring statistical sensitivity over specificity, and six, by emphasizing statistical significance rather than the magnitude of the effect. Here we detail the many logical and methodological transgressions involved in assigning functionality to almost every nucleotide in the human genome. The ENCODE results were predicted by one of its authors to necessitate the re rewriting of textbooks. We agree. Many textbooks dealing with marketing, mass media hype, and public relations may well have to be rewritten. Nice. Burn. That there is a tongue lashing. <laughs> that was a science burn. Right? Bam. Yeah. That, I mean, this is scientists bashing scientists. And, yeah. Yeah. They have some serious, serious uh, 
questions about the research, allegations about the, the way the research was done, and they back it up very thoroughly in this paper, which can be found at the Journal of Genome Biology and Evolution. And I actually really, really recommend people to take a look at it because if you are wondering um, what the current state and understanding of evolution uh, at the uh, genetic level is, this paper uh, goes through everything. I mean, it, it talks about it from a, a biological standpoint, from just a genomic standpoint, talks about all sorts of factors um, and all the research that really, uh, really holds up our current understanding of evolution. So it's a great paper, just a great review paper in general. Um, so I don't know, I can't wait to hear the rebuttals and how everything comes back from the ENCODES consortium because there's a lot of people who were involved in this research and they published over 30 papers last year. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of work. It's a lot so, of work. And then people, you know, to be coming back and going, your work. That's, that's mean a lot anything. of work for someone to make things up. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, they're not saying that they made stuff up. It's well, just that it sounds they like had... they jumped to wrongful conclusions is what right. they're saying. Right. But also, it seems like within 30 papers, there would be very little jumping to conclusions. But yeah. I guess, you know. You no science is perfect, which is why the peer review process of science is so important and powerful and amazing. Yeah, and then, well, you know, and I don't know <laughs> right or anything about this. However, from your tongue lashing uh, perspective, which I agree with because it's the last thing I've heard, um, <laughs> it seems to be pointing to willful manipulation because of the the ways it uh, the ways that it. You know, chose data points and mm -hmm. chose to look at them in specific ways yep. which might not be as rigorous but might be easily pointing in a direction that the authors may have wanted or a chief exactly. author might have wanted or whoever's orchestrating might have wanted a specific result. Why would they want a specific result? What would be the motive behind that? Or is it just hey look what we're discovering now jump on board and write something that comes along with it like that doesn't sound like most scientists would really well, well you could see how if you thought it was only 10 percent of dna that was useful and all of a sudden you find out it's 80 percent that would be huge headlines that would be phenomenal that would be something that you would become known for and that would be a yeah. groundbreaking discovery and yeah. i can see how that's why the 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 public forum and the peer review process in science is so important is because we are human and most of us entering an experimental process have a preconceived notion. That's why you run an experiment. So it's very easy to see data going a certain way when maybe to someone else it's not going that way. Mm -hmm. I think it's just part yeah. of, you know, human flaw and human influence and there's no such thing as complete object objectivity. It's just, it doesn't really exist, which is why you just have to have different people looking at it from different angles. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, why they talk about um, sensitivity over specificity. That's the that comment in the abstract. Um, in statistical data analysis, if you, so they stay here in, uh, in the paper. Um, let's see, what do they say? Uh, so they, they start talking about type 1 and type 2 statistical errors, which is basically um, uh, false positives versus false negatives. And, um, and so they at one point they say there's an indication that increasing the number of false positives is a worthy pursuit in the eyes of some ENCODE researchers. And that's a, a false positive for people who aren't familiar with that is that uh, you get a positive result when, a positive statistical result when in fact it, it's actually negative. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and they go on to say, of course, judiciously trading off specificity for sensitivity is a standard and sound practice in statistical data analysis. However, by increasing the number of false positives, ENCODE achieves an increase in the total number of test positives, thereby exaggerating the fraction of functional elements within the genome. And then they say, we must ask ourselves, what is the aim of ENCODE? Is it to identify every possible functional element at the expense of increasing the number of elements that are falsely identified as functional? Or is it to create a list of functional elements that is as free of false positives as possible? 
So, yeah. Anyway, interesting questions and interesting uh, points to bring up. And uh, there are, you know, a priori assumptions that you can make. And uh, when you're setting up your, your tests and your statistical analyses, ideally in the research world, to get around your bias, when you're doing your experimental setup, you do a power test to figure out exactly how large a sample at what number of replications uh, you need to have to get a, uh, a statistically significant uh, result. And then, um, from there, you have particular assumptions that uh, you have a null hypothesis, your alternative hypotheses, and you set up your experiment and your test groups and your control groups accordingly so that it takes out the human bias. Right. And, and so what they're suggesting is that at the statistical analysis side, you know, what they probably did is maybe did their analysis after, mm -hmm. or they just had... Um, they used biased assumptions and the wrong, and chose the wrong statistical approach. Right. Yeah. And gen oh. just generally speaking, anytime you have a system that can have false positives, it's really easy to minimize the the idea that a false positive, even if it's you know point one percent uh, chance of it being a false positive, you have to factor that, figure that that false positive though can happen on every analysis so it's actually much it turns out that it's a much higher number of having uh, you know, even a 0.1% chance of having a false positive adds up to something like a 10% chance that it's that all of your positives are false it's like yeah. A, it's yeah so it's a really interesting question this is a really big uh, the encode consortium is a really big project with a lot of people involved, a lot of money thrown at it. It's This is the big science arena as opposed to the small science arena. Um, and there is a, you know, uh, a big question as to whether big science, uh, because it's big and it's supposed to generate big world rocking results, mm -hmm. that you're going to find high impact false positives. And then maybe small science, <laughs> maybe the, just the way that they, the, our um, ill-designed scientific structure, in, uh, industrial structure is made up, uh, you know, maybe we're going to end up with these high-impact false posit positives from big science, and then small science has to kind of fix it. <laughs> and here's, <laughs> here's an example. <laughs> Fine-tune it. To put a quick number on my, uh, my, my, my false positive thing I was saying there with it. If you have a if you have a, a 0.1% chance, you know, of a false positive, it sounds super super low. So if you get a result that's positive, you just assume it's correct, right? Mm -hmm. But if your your sample size is say a thousand, and of that uh, there's only ten that are that are positive, right? Well, I guess in this case there might be eleven, right? Because it means <laughs> if you have a 0.1% chance, uh, one of those ten is a false positive. Yeah. One of your 10 positives. So that's 10% then of your data of positives is going to be wrong. Just right on, on that scale. Now, you don't, I don't know what scale of numbers they're using for the positives and that, but false positives, if that's possible in the system, can add up to really massive errors uh, very quickly if yeah. you're not being careful with it. Massive. Massive. <laughs> Massive. You know, if you think you, if you think your error is between you know point one and it's really ten percent, that's a big difference. That's magnetism of differences. It's, yeah, could yeah. change a lot of 100. output from the input. <laughs> <This is. laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I think this is a really interesting development, and uh, you know we'll see where the researchers take it from here. It's always interesting Let's stay to with see the, the story as it develops. Yeah, the scientific <laughs> volleying back and forth. Let's, yeah, we will stay with his story. More from Twist later on this. <laughs> and now, Justin, uh -oh, uh -oh. what's breaking in your neck of the woods? Breaking, breaking, uh, I just brought, there's a super massive black hole uh, that's not breaking, but it's spinning really super it's fast. Spinning. It's super massive and super fast. Uh, it is some 2 million miles across, which doesn't really seem that big in the cosmic scape, uh, scope of times. But that would be, uh, it's, it's a pretty good distance. It's, uh, uh, 
what is it to our from our from here to the moon? What is it? Four hundred thousand miles ish, something like that. Mm-hmm. So two million. It's a, it's a really mm-hmm. long way away. Well, I mean, but it's big distance across. That's massive. That would encompass our whole solar system. You could fit it in there uh, very easily. So the astronomers measured its spin rate. This is a black supermassive black hole in the center of a spiral galaxy. If you're looking for it, uh, NGC 1365. It's maybe a place to avoid. Uh, astronomers measured this jaw-dropping spin rate using new data from the Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, or New Star. And this was also they had the European Space Agency's XMM Newton X-ray satellite providing data. It's the first time anyone has accurately measured the spin of a supermassive black hole. So that's a first for science. Woo! Yay! I love science firsts. Uh, let's see. The research that is being published uh, today, actually. It was published earlier today in the journal Nature uh, and, it, and featured a NASA media teleconference uh, yesterday, which I missed because they made me just forget to call me. Darn. The black hole's gravity is so strong that as the black hole spins, it drags the surrounding space along with it. The edge of the spinning hole is called the event horizon. Any material crossing the event horizon is pulled into the black hole, and spiraling matter collects onto an accretion disk where friction heats it and causes it to emit x-rays. The speed of this thing, though, is what was blowing me away when I was... uh, it's nearly, they don't put the, how do they measure the spin and not give us a number? But they say it's nearly the speed of light. Yeah, it's very, it is nearly, uh, I have an article, let me see if I can pull it up to get the, keep going, I'll see if I can get the, get the Okay, amount. so it says uh, it's several million suns, can you, several millions? How big was this, how big was this universe before we got here? Because this, if they managed to fit several million suns in this one black hole, uh, it, it, it took billions of years to sucking up these stars to get there, but still. Uh, spin, it says, results from a transfer of angular momentum, uh, like playing on a children's swing. If you kick at random times while you swing, you'll never get very high, but if you kick at the beginning, each downswing, you go higher and higher as you add angular momentum. I never knew that swinging was angular momentum. No, I don't know. All right, so... Uh... Mm-hmm. Speed of light is 186,000 miles per second, mm-hmm. right? And so it's 85, 84% as fast as the speed of light, which makes it 156,240 mm-hmm. miles per second. Whoa. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's at the center of the spiral galaxy, a spherical region of space-time whirling around that's more than 2 million miles in diameter. Holy cow. So this is, uh, now can we go back in time if we go to the center of this, or do we just get crushed? Because I think... No, probably alternate dimension. Alternate dimension? Mm-hmm. Very tiny dimension. You end we're, up we're all cowboys. Curled up and <laughs> we become yeah. cowboys. It is interesting because it's so massive and it's moving so quickly, uh, it is actually moving the space around it. It's Dragging it's, it with dragging, it, pulling it around. Yeah, uh, dragging it. But what is it moving when it's moving space? The, I, I don't know. I don't know. Everything else around mean? it is moving. Yeah, stuff is moving, but it's dragging space itself. I still don't know what... Maybe it's like when you take a, a, a mop or a broom handle and you twist it in the middle of a, a towel or a carpet and everything kind of starts following around. Wait a like that? Is that, that a good is? I don't know. I'm just asking <laughs> the questions. When they say that space is warping, it always really confuses me. Does that mean space is a thing? It's a stuff? It's an absolute it's an area? Or do they just mean time has been augmented so that things moving through that empty ish space, vacuum of space, have been altered time dimensionally and they are moving slower or faster in time than they were? It's all so confusing. Yeah, I think there's missing data. I, think there's a fa- <laughs> I still think there's a false positive out there. Somebody overlooked when they were just figuring out the universe. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> or maybe not. We need to get somebody on. Just ask them that one question someday. When space is being warped, what is being warped? Because you said space. Your brain. Not, didn't tell me anything. Uh, it's... 
<laughs> just your brain, Justin. Actually, uh, we scientists came up with the term warpage of space for specifically the reason of messing with the minds of people yes. who were trying to figure out what that meant. Exactly. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, the um, one thing that uh, the IO9 article that I uh, that I saw the researchers involved they say that they insist that even more important than this being the first time that they've measured the spin of a black hole uh, it can tell us about the development of the black hole and the surrounding galaxy I guess uh, there's because of the way that it has accreted matter um, if it had accreted it in a, a lopsided way and a random kind of chaotic way uh, it would not be able to spin nearly as quickly so the really really rapid spin suggests that it had a very even vacuum effect it was well uh, well nourished on millions of stars yeah on a good time schedule <laughs> on a regular schedule Sweet. It wouldn't it be terrible to be like this interstellar space traveling uh, civilization that like had to keep changing solar systems. It's like, nope, that one's getting dragged in too. It's going in the same way the last three did. We got to keep going one solar system further as sun after sun gets sucked into the <laughs> giant supermassive black hole. You really hole. only have to worry about it if you're uh, that long lived. <laughs> <laughs> you know. All right, Blair. I think it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. Oh, mothership. Oh, <laughs> the mothership is here. What's happening? Uh oh. You didn't want to hear me talk about penises anymore. Well, too bad. Oh. Don't. So. I said earlier I wanted to talk about otter bacula. Bacula is pl plural of baculum. Justin, do you know what a baculum is? No? Mm. Kiki? It sounds very familiar, but my brain, since I mentioned it earlier, is only fixated on Scott Bacula. And I yes. do not believe there is a is plural. It does not have to do with quantum leap. It does is not. it the thing at the back of your throat? <laughs> no. It is, in fact, a penis bone. So, why do we call it a boner? Because most mammals have bones in there. Oh. Swear. We're weirdos. We don't have them. Most mammals do. So, a bacula, baculum is a penis bone. And chemicals... It, in the water in rivers in Europe are linked to problems with otter bacula. <laughs> so what they've noticed is they've been doing post-mortem studies on otters in the wild in Europe and I guess they've been doing it for a very long time because they have a, a data set to look at to compare current bacula weights to. And what they've noticed is the bacula weights are getting smaller and smaller. The penis bones are shrinking. Now here's the it's scary shrinking. thing about this. Yes, yeah, shrink. There's shrinkage. <laughs> Sorry, had to say it. The water. The, <laughs> the water's so cold. It's. Oh, yeah. Well, so here's the really weird thing, though. Is that we've seen with other pollutants in water, we've seen things happening with fish where they become feminized. This is where mm -hmm. male attributes shrink and female attributes start to show up in the males. Why is this a problem? <laughs> well, <laughs> if we only have females, yeah. chances are the species is not going to survive. Yeah, causes a few reproductive both. problems. I don't know. I don't really see yeah, a problem. It is a hit well, if you're a whiptail lizard, it doesn't matter. But most animals need males. No, no, no. I know, but just not as many. I mean, 
Yeah, and if you can get the females to turn it's back into males though. again, then it's fine. Or if you right. have hermaphroditic yes. or... Um, no, I'm not saying go that far. I'm just saying what's the, what's <laughs> so the matter with... So we should just like release a, more chemicals uh, in the hope that Just change that everything will, entirely. I think the surviving what's, males what's will the appreciate What's the opposite it. of feminize? Testosterize? <laughs> yeah, I think the surviving males, <laughs> the if they have a 20% male like. population, I think those 20% will be the happiest... Uh, males of any species. Well, yes, but there will be a little bit of a, a genetic bottleneck if that happens. Um, For a little we can while. see some there runaway we'll mutations that are not very good. Um, but so, anyway, they were looking specifically at chemicals actually that they had banned in the 1970s uh, persistent organic pollutants. Mm -hmm which were att attributed with a, a heavy decline in otter populations then. They almost wiped out the European otters. But once they outlawed them, they saw the populations increase steadily over time. But they're wondering if this is residual from that or if these similar chemicals are coming from somewhere else. No, it looks like it's different chemicals. They saw no association between the old chemicals and the animal's penis bones becoming lighter. So instead, they're looking at modern contaminants, which also includes potential drugs leaching into right. uh, the estuaries. Water. Yeah, I right. mean, you get you have people. I mean, the the treatment plants they clean water as much as they can before it goes out, but it's not, I mean, unless you're reusing water, very often the water just goes out into the waterways, and there's all sorts of drugs floating out there. We have uh, fish being treated for depression. Right, exactly. Schizophrenia. Yeah. Uh, menopause. I know, right? <laughs> and it's just causing all sorts of problems, and then it makes you wonder, okay, what is it doing to us? Food right? supply, too. It's like a whole other thing. Food. But... Yeah, all of these drugs are also considered endocrine-disrupting chemicals, which is exactly yeah. what they think is causing this problem, because effects in, uh, to the endocrine system would disrupt a lot of hormone levels, which would disrupt the development of certain reproductive elements, such as bacula. Mm -hmm. So this looks like a very good um, culprit. The other thing they're looking at, though, is some sort of environmental pollutant in the atmosphere that is then getting rained down mm -hmm. into the rivers. So they have a few different things to look at, but mainly they're thinking it's EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals. They're just not sure where it's coming from. But I think that we're going to see more and more of this happening because how many more people are taking these medications and also what kind of dosage we're giving because if we're giving a higher dosage than we need is a lot of it going straight through and coming out in urine completely unaltered in the body and then that causes even more issues once it comes into the environment this is a whole side of kind of the increase of of the population taking drugs that they may or may not need that could actually be affecting our environment, which is a whole other mm -hmm. side of things that I think a lot of people have not considered. It's very interesting. Yeah, well, the it's there's a lot of talk about uh, cradle to grave. So how do you deal with stuff from the time that it is created and the, uh, the, the chemical processes and uh, waste products from just the creation of products? And then how are they used? And then how are, how do we get rid of them? How are they discarded? And what effect are they going to have on the environment? And very often, at least here in the United States, we have a, um, it's like no harm until proven policy mm -hmm. on chemicals. And uh, people are working to see if we can, because you know, if, if something is in a certain family of endocrine, endocrine disruptors, it's probably going to be an environmental endocrine disruptor. If it is, oh, yeah. if it is part of a family of chemical compounds that are persistent in the environment, it probably will be. You know, you can kind of guess the traits of a chemical based on what kind of a family it's coming from. Um, but there are there are a lot of people working to make sure that tests, chemical tests, proper tests, are developed so that 
all chemicals are regulated from the minute that they're created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's Fingers really crossed. key. I think it's also key to try to find a way to deliver these things where they don't go straight through your body into the sewer systems. It's also really key to find a better way to clean our water before we put it out there because I think there's a lot of older filtering systems that are still working perfectly for 90% of what we need, but we have a rising need to filter out these chemical compounds, and it hasn't really been looked into yet, I don't think, um, just, as much as it should. Yeah, I'm just imagining the, uh, the marketing campaign, stop penis bone shrinkage now! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Stop go egg growth in male fish now. Can we do, can we have a fun can we have have a fun picket line somewhere? That would be like the most fun picket line ever. People would be like, "What are you protesting?" Should we do it outside, uh, <laughs> like a, a medical building or something? Right. <laughs> <sighs> And it's all, well. This, we've been talking about this for years too. Is like the potential for a new superbug to develop in our wastewater because of all the antibiotics that are. Mm -hmm. That's um, certainly true. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of it, but I don't understand. Yeah, I don't see how we can stop people from taking um, pharmaceuticals and peeing. <laughs> like, right. Like it's just uh, we're kind of. Yeah. Well, a lot of pharmaceuticals, yeah. when they're dosed properly break up into more basic chemical components inside your body. Gotcha. But I do think there's a, there's a tendency to overdose rather than underdose, which makes yeah. sense in a lot of cases, but yeah. if if you're not looking too closely at at the body weight and biological chemistry of the person that you're prescribing to, it's possible that you can way overdose something and it all just goes straight through them into the water. Yeah. And I think very often there is just a general like, okay, take this dosage kind of. Exactly. Uh, yeah. When it comes to antibiotics, when it comes to, you know, lots of just kind of generic solutions for problems. Yeah. When I actually, when I got bit at the zoo in Jerusalem and they prescribed me antibiotics, it was the exact same dosage and type of antibiotics that they gave to the animals at the zoo. And so I was able to get my supply of antibiotics from the veterinary storeroom at the zoo, which just kind of tells you that you're giving a bear the same amount as you're giving maybe a penguin as you're giving a human. <laughs> That's probably not the most effective way. Even it's though you're doubling in some cases or yeah. having in some cases, it's not very scientifically decided or derived exactly how much you're giving that animal. Yeah. Or that person. Hmm, dear. Uh, do you think it's time for us to take a break? It's probably about Let's time. Do it. Yeah? All right. So I think I have some more music here somewhere. Uh, let's see if I can find it. I, uh, uh. Uh, uh, ooh, there's twist stuff there. Oh, how about... Wait, where'd you go? <laughs> this is ridiculous. All right, everybody, uh, back from that musical interlude. So fine, so fine. What was I going to tell you about? Oh, yes, how you can support TWIS. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 books in its library. Several of them are science books, and we've enjoyed a few over the years. And think that if you were to give them a try, you might find a few books that you enjoy as well. And in the process, when you sign up, with audible.com, you support TWIS. So what you can do right now is go to audiblepodcast.com slash TWIS. That's audiblepodcast.com slash TWIS. And you'll be able to get a free audiobook download so you get something while you're giving. It's pretty awesome. Sign up, audiblepodcast.com slash TWIS. Get a free audiobook download and enjoy and know that you're doing some good. It's a win-win situation for you and us. 
That's awesome. Um, also, if you're interested in supporting us in the manner of uh, buying swag, we have uh, a bunch of stuff that's available at Zazzle.com. And now we have a nice little button that will take you from the front page of our website, from our uh, menu bar, to our Zazzle.com store. So all you have to do is go to twist.org. That's right, TWIS.org, our website, and you can look for the link to head over to Zazzle.com where our store exists and you can find t-shirts and sweatshirts and hats and keychains and all sorts of fun stuff, even Christmas ornaments if you feel like getting prepared for that early. Well, I know, it's always Twistmas somewhere, right? And finally, if the swaggy stuff isn't for you, you're not interested in audiobooks or you've already been there, done that, we also accept donations, and your donations do go to support the entire running of what we do with Twist. It hosts our bandwidth, our um, our uh, where we put stuff online. I am completely losing words right now. Allergies. I hate them. I hate them. Um, but anyway, it, your donations basically let us run and keep us going so that we don't go offline. And uh, by donating you get a nice warm fuzzy feeling. It's great. And you just you know that you are helping us do what we do. And we've made the process really easy for you. Go to our twist.org website and hit any of the pinkish PayPal donation buttons that are anywhere on the site and you'll be able to uh, donate any amount and we will take any amount that you are willing to give. And we thank you very, very much because we really couldn't do this without you. You can't believe what a skeptic I am. What a skeptic I've been. Welcome back, everyone. This is This Week in Science. Justin, do you have another story? No, oh, Justin, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> you see lots of mouth moving. Yeah, uh, we're back with This Week in Science. Um, I, on the heels of talking about too much antibiotics in our wastewater, uh, too much antibiotic in your own intestinal system can cause your microflora to go wacky. Uh, can kill it off. It can uh, get to the point where it doesn't actually recover its normal uh, diversity. So mm -hmm. that you then get uh, gastrointestinal tract vulnerability to being colonized by pathogens you don't want. So your antibiotics can weaken your system. Researchers from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, New York, and the Centro Superior de Investigación Salud Pública Valencia, Spain, so that reintroducing normal microbial diversity largely eliminated vancomycin-resistant enterochia. Enter, uh, enter, I don't know what the... But uh, VRE from, your intest from the intestinal tracts of mice. Vesker showed that further... Uh, so for that, the findings may apply as well to humans and is being published in the journal Infection and Immunity. That is, uh, the reduced diversity of microbiota uh, wrought by antibiotics allows VREs to invade and thrive in the intestine, suggesting that bacterial species that are wiped out by the antibiotics and that are uh, sort of native to your gut are key in preventing this colonization. Uh, it says, uh, Carlos Ubeda of the Centro Superior de Investigación in Saudad Pública in Spain. We hypothesize that repopulating the mice intestines with the missing bacteria would promote clearance of the VRE. And according to this study, that was correct. Ding, 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 ding. They, they, uh, researchers traded the mice with antibiotics and gave the mice <clears throat> fecal transplants uh, from untreated mice that uh, the technical term fecal transplant that's basically taking uh, the, the the layman term poop 
from uh, another mouse and transplanting it into the mouse that had the antibiotics. Uh, and not so, just transplanting it anywhere, but making sure that it goes into the lower intestine yeah. so that you're, you are repopulating the intestinal area, the intestinal tract with the appropriate bacteria. And they discovered that the mice receiving this transplant were able to clear the VRE, uh, while those receiving an aerobic culture failed to do so. <laughs> yeah, so they had another, they, they did both the transplant and an anaerobic, anaerobic culture. Uh, the researchers compared the microbiota in each group. Big difference, the mice that had cleared the VRE contained bact uh, bacteria that uh, from the anaerobic genius while those that had failed to clear did not. It didn't, uh, didn't stay, I guess. Researchers then analyzed the fecal microbiota from human patients who received bone marrow transplants who were at high risk of being colonized by VRE, and the presence of barnacilia in fecal samples was associated with, protein, uh, with protection against VRE, suggesting that in humans, barnacilia, or barnacilia, I can't <laughs> may also confer protection against the VRE colonization. Finding to be very useful in development of novel probiotics. Scientifically, this is a major finding that will help us understand how microbiota confer resistance against intestinal colonization by pathogens. An important question that remains incompletely answered, says Ubeda. I love this line of research. I mean, it's just... it's. It's this is kind of the, the basic straightforward research. It's not hard to explain. <laughs> it's yeah. like you take antibiotics, you kill things off, or, and, and you get maybe bad bacteria, and then if you transfer the bad poo for good poo, you get better bacteria, and you're happy again. Yeah. You know, it, so this, this, okay, so this does two things, actually. This, um, it makes those probiotic drinks not perhaps as effective uh, in the future, of proper probiotics um, not being in drink form. Uh, oh, and also it, it sub resubstantiates and reinforces my theory on why aliens probe us. <laughs> they need our bacteria. They're from the future. They're future <laughs> humans. They need our gut bacteria to repopulate uh, normal gut function in the future. <laughs> I think it's an interesting hypothesis, at least. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, if you believe Sater, in aliens, Gilda Sater says something here. very uh, poignant. I don't know how up in there an enema actually gets, but could you uh, have a future with probiotic enemas? Would that be a proper transplantation? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. That's all it would take. I have heard, and this is not... Uh, I have heard of a um, kind of, what do you call it when it's not medical, just a regular uh, elective? Or something, just a regular treatment that elective. you at home, not elective, but um, anyway, oh. kind of medicine that people have kind of passing down from person to person. Homeopathic. <laughs> not homeopathic, not watered down. Um, <laughs> naturopathic, basically, but uh, I've heard that yogurt, plain yogurt can be used to treat um, vaginal bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. and so you can put How would eating yogurt, yogurt affect That's not problem. what I was suggesting, Justin. Oh, you it's mean... It's similar I, to the idea of a probiotic gotcha. enema. So I it is, gotcha. you know, you're putting something that contains good bacteria in a space where there are bad bacteria and allowing it to to do some work so maybe there is some there could be some benefit and maybe instead of wheatgrass enemas we're going to be seeing signs for probiotic enemas really soon or, or according to identity four in the chat room a new higher better use for gogurt <laughs> oh dear that's not what I was suggesting. <laughs> I did not say gogurt, and I really would not suggest <laughs> trying this, ladies or gentlemen. I feel like this crossed the line. <laughs> <laughs> we, may, we may no longer be in science territory. We may be, I swear. But I can't help but ask which flavors. 
No. no. But it had to be the plain yogurt. I don't think they make a plain go. I don't think yogurt comes with plain. <laughs> no. You guys, if there's sugar in there, it would promote the growth yeah. of yeast and other bad bacteria. So it has to be plain yogurt with no sugars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Except for the milk sugars that the bacteria are already living on. But anyway, we should probably move on, right? <laughs> uh, possibly. So there's news this week. Um... I was sent a story by Tom Rockwell, uh, who is currently doing great over on Doctor Doctor Demento's shows. He's a he does a geek core music, and he's done a couple of songs for Twist compilations. And I hear he's doing he's he's going way up the charts, the Demento charts. It's pretty awesome. But anyway, he sent me uh, the story, as did some other people, and. Uh, Looking into it, rats communicating through their brains, right? Uh-huh. It's, the, it's the impending rat rebellion. If only rats could talk to each other and control each other, use the, the connected power of their brains, what could they do? Well, that's not really what the researchers were looking into, but um, this is some interesting re- research led by Miguel Nicolelis. Uh, he's a neuroscientist at Duke University Medical Center, and he is uh, part of the team that's been involved in putting a brain-computer interface uh, on monkeys and allowing monkeys to control right. robotic arms with their brains. You've brought these stories oh. in very often, Justin. You discovered the uh, motor neuron function and the, the couple of, uh, yeah. Yeah, so Miguel Nicolelis, great track record, seems like a really, he's... He's an interesting, really great scientist. Um, he, they've done some work reporting in scientific reports about uh, an experiment they did where they connected uh, a rat. They put an electrode array in a rat's brain, and they taught the rat to press levers, right lever, left lever, in response to uh, an LED light blinking. So if it blinked a a certain pattern, then it was right. If it blinked a certain pattern, then it was left. Once the rat had learned the lever pressing pattern, they recorded the neural signals coming from, or not coming from, but being produced by the brain while the rat was pushing either right or left. Mm -hmm. Then they took those signals, fed it through their computer, and turned it into another signal that they then sent to another rat in an adjoining cage. And so they actually report that the rats, uh, in order to get drinks of water or f- uh, uh, water or sugar water rewards or food rewards, they uh, cooperated. So if a rat, if the rat that got the signal receive was on the receiving end of the signal got it wrong then they said that it appeared as if uh, the sending rat would do something to make it so that the other rat got it right the next time how much of this was actually would be cooperation or real communication I don't think they're actually that you know the rats don't know that they're communicating because they don't know they don't understand there's a link between their brains but the rats probably did notice if the, if they could see each other that mm-hmm. if they did certain things, the other rat would do something that okay. they'd get a reward. So there's probably so, a certain amount of. So, so let me back up something I said real quick uh, earlier. Uh, I said that he was involved in ex- uh, discovering uh, motor neurons. It you meant mirror, right? It was well, they were they were monitoring motor neurons mm-hmm. and they were recording motor neurons as. Uh, monkeys would grab something, and they were recording the, the clickety click, click clack, whatever noise was coming through their sensors as the monkeys were grabbing things and touching things and doing things. They discovered <clears throat> uh, the mirror neurons from this research because as one of the lab assistants came in to clear out the, I think it was acorns or walnuts or something they were they were grabbing, went to clear the experiment and grabbed them and took them away. The motor neurons in the monkeys fired off the same way they had when they were actually doing it. This was sort of the key to discovering the mirror neurons because, hey, what's going on? Their motor cortex is firing just like they were when they were physically grabbing it by watching somebody else grab it, right? So what's fascinating about this is they 
it's almost, it's not so much that they're controlling or communicating, but by hearing this signal, it's almost like you're firing off the mirror neurons that you would if somebody was watching somebody else do something. So it's almost like they're getting to see the other rat Right? They're firing off their mirror neurons of getting to see the other rat maybe, do the thing. Maybe, maybe. I mean, that's that's assuming that's assuming a lot to think that the, the mirror neurons are ne mirror neurons are firing, and this is what's going on in the rat's brains. So what I mean, uh, the the research goes on. So the rats are not uh, always next to each other in cages. The research goes on to uh, use whisker stimulation, and so. Um, uh, rats have uh, in their brain an area called uh, the barrel cortex, and each of these barrels, which are easy to, they're, they're pretty well lo located in the brain, um, easily located in the brain. Um, each barrel represents a whisker on the rat's face, and so uh, rats use their whiskers to determine whether or not they can fit into tight openings, that kind of thing. Um, so they stuck electrodes into the whisker, uh, the barrel, barrel, uh, the barrel cortexes, of, uh, the barrel, whatever, the little barrels in the brains. <laughs> <laughs> they stuck, they stuck the, the electrodes into the barrels in the brains, and they recorded the signal that came when uh, the right side of the whiskers was stimulated versus the left side of the, the, of the whiskers. And then they sent the signal to a rat in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to the wonders of the Internet and uh, computer software technology, they were able to analyze that signal and turn it into a, uh, a signal of uh, multiple pus pulses versus no pulse, so kind of a binary signal, on or off, and if they felt, they learned, the rats were taught that if they learned multiple pulses to turn right, say, or if they heard, if they got no pulses to turn left. And so the rats responded in a better than chance of uh, number of, of choices. So it was about 62% of the time, 64% of the time in both of these tests. It's not perfect, but it's better than random. So it means that they are actually respond, these rats are responding to signals that are not originating in their own brains, that they're coming from another brain. So I, my big beef with this whole thing is that these rats, they're not how can you have uh, cooperation, the whole statement of, or not cooperation, collaboration, mm -hmm. if they really don't know that they're working together? Like the rat in America and the rat in Brazil know nothing about each other. They just feel signals coming into their brain mm -hmm. that tell them to do something. They have learned a stimulus response pattern. And so, yes, we know we can record these signals from one rat and we can send those signals into another rat's brain and that, that rat will go, oh, I know this, it makes me want to do this. Not that they understand that, that that's what that signal is, it's just this is, this is the signal, this is what my brain feels like, this is when I want to do this. Yeah. Well, okay, so... so, so meh, so meh, not thing, impressed. But, I'm going to be like the, Michaela, what's her name? If the experiment was trying to get one... One mouse to who's learned a pattern. Uh, so not that they are teaching it to the other mouse, but for that information to get transferred to the other mouse, right? And and I'm assuming Nikolai has got this. He's he's got to be working with the motor cortex for a lot of this, or the same area of the mirror neurons, because this is his specialty. What? It, here, here's kind of how I say it. it's not so much that you're watching somebody else doing it. Okay, well, we'll say that. We, we, they're not aware that they're watching through the mirror neurons or through the motor cortex, something else going on. But, but from a mouse's perspective, what's the difference between you're wanting to do something and your brain firing off from instinct, from habit, from anything else, versus bam, there's the signal, right? Must be my brain. Right? Telling me I gotta figure this out. So now I'm interested. Now I'm paying attention and trying to figure it out. In a way, you're collaborating with yourself the same way you collaborate with yourself when you try to solve any problem. Right. You try right. some stuff, it doesn't work, you try some stuff, it doesn't you you learn get more it. feedback and you learn. But the You learn the signals of the neurons, your right. brain learns a particular pattern, and you, right. you get rid of other patterns that don't work, and you respond in a particular way to a pattern of signals in your brain, and that's behavior. Yes. Boom boom boom. boom. Yeah. I think we both agree and disagree at the same exact moment. Yeah, I'm not really. <laughs> but, 
But uh, I love I love this research. I love everything this guy. He comes up with some great ideas for doing stuff. And yeah, also very I mean, terrifying because it's it something is... that they learn to mass produce these signals and we just right. can mind control. So the question is now, you know, is there some way that we can teach? I mean, right now they're just showing proof of concept that they have a signal that goes from one rat to another. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a series of experiments the way that there were with the monkey experiments where uh, initially it was just a monkey uh, controlling a, c a cursor on a screen and it went to a robotic arm and now, uh, you know, we're looking at people controlling robotic attack, you know, ro robots and other attachments to be able to um, survive if they're paralyzed. Um, yeah, they, they started with the, they started with the uh, monkeys using a joystick. Uh -huh. And eventually yeah. realized that they, they no longer to. needed the the joystick. <laughs> they could just think about using the, how they use the joystick, and have their hands off the joystick and still be controlling the cursor on the screen, which was also controlling the robotic arm. The other room just I think that part was just for kicks. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, you know, first we had robotic mice, or, or not robotic, but um, remote controlled rats mm -hmm. that they've been using for a while joysticks control rats and now we've got rats kind of sending information from rat to rat what's the next step where is the research going to go from here are they actually going to try and get the rats like really mind melded and communicating through that connection to each other is it going you know where's it going to go next <laughs> right and also the little bit of disappointing thing is even direct mind to mind uh, connection over the internet still requires a mouse so I had to figure out how to get that in there somewhere. A rat. Was... A rat. <laughs> a dirty rat. <laughs> yeah, been... quantum, quantum rat computers, right. <laughs> Janice Q7 says monkeys start to control the rats. <laughs> Our world is going to be taken over by monkeys and their rat slave minions. <laughs> the rebellion is... Just begun. <laughs> and before we before we get to the point where we have these interconnected sentient uh, these sentient rats of the future, we should really figure out where their politics lie. Because if they're really anti-human, I don't know if we want to nudge them in the sentient yeah. direction. I don't know. I'm we hoping we'll experiment on who are more pro-human. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we're gonna figure out. Yeah. What <clears> animals <throat> are pro-human? I don't think cats Dogs. really are. Because <laughs> if you notice, if, as soon as a cat human. scales up, they start devouring humans. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's got to be dogs are the only cats. option. Yeah, dogs are the only ones so far that I don't think really mean us any ill will. <laughs> I like I, I I like to think you know I, I like to hope that rats and and monkeys are not enough like us that they're not going to fall prey to the social media ills that we have today. No drunk texting rats. Come on. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on, guys. <laughs> oh, good gracious. Behavior. It's too bad. It's too bad that technology progresses linear the way or the way it has. Because I can I can sort of picture this sort of steampunk past potential future somewhere in the industrial age where this technology got uh, figured out, but the only way we could communicate long distances was through our rats. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we had rats with little skull caps, and we'd send a message like mouse code across the world. <laughs> oh, 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 I don't have time. Talk to my okay. rat. Sorry. <laughs> my you rat was hairy. You'd have like specialists who would be like uh, tapping, you know, touching mouse whiskers very like intently to get the message out across. Like D Day will be on this day, and the mouse is like. There's another mouse on the other side of the Atlantic that's doing the same thing. We're getting the message from the mouse, and it's... Oh, my goodness. Do you have any more stories? There were more. I, this is my favorite, though. I don't want to leave this. We can keep thinking about... Uh, okay, oh, uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, bioengineering, researchers, uh, bioengineering researchers at University of California, Santa Barbara, tweaked the shape of a chemotherapy drug nanoparticle from spherical to rod shaped hmm. and that was the change that they made the only change that they made and it made the change that they made. It, it made the uh, chemotherapy drug 10,000 times more effective 
at specifically targeting and delivering anti-cancer drugs to breast cancer cells. <clears throat> wow. Isn't that That's cool. wild? Mm -hmm. Yeah, conventional anti-cancer drugs accumulate in the liver, lungs, and spleen instead of the cancer cell site due to inefficient interactions with the cancer cell membrane, explained uh, Samir Mitragadi, professor of chemical engineering, director of the Center for Bioengineering at UCSB. We have found our strategy greatly enhances the specificity of anti-cancer drugs to cancer cells. Pretty amazing. Hmm. Yeah, well, we've found, um, I know there's been research suggesting that particular nanoparticle uh, shapes will affect uh, cells in different ways. So uh, there's one, um, like, I think, I think it's like, like asbestos or um, other nano, uh, nanoparticles that are, that are rod-shaped. So it's interesting that they sh right. changed it from a sphere to a rod, but uh, rod-shaped nanoparticles that you inhale can actually uh, instigate cancer development in your lungs. And so there, there are moves afoot to try and change nanoparticle shapes in uh, aerosols, things that you could actually end up breathing. Yeah, Samir, so. Samir says here, we were inspired to look at the shape as a key parameter by looking at natural objects first. In nature, uh, key particles such as viruses, bacteria, red blood cells uh, are non-spherical. Their shape plays mm -hmm. a key role in their function. It's perhaps... Uh, how they get gated in and out of certain parts of the body, how they get, you know, filtered and all the rest of it. So, uh, very, uh, wow. Yeah. It's almost like a sculptor discovery, you know what I mean? Or just a uh, noticing how nature goes along to get along, kind of a, very neat. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's another story that uh, I wanted to touch on. I don't know how long we could actually talk about it, but, you know, I can always cut things out of the podcast, I guess. No, I never would. We had some, we had some down moments in this show. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a letter from Minion Jim, and he wrote, I'd love to hear you guys discuss this proposed banned Mars mission by the millionaire Dennis Tito. Uh, and there's a bunch of different story sources out there. The whole idea, so this is Jim's comment. And so if you don't know about what's happening, there is a, a millionaire slash billionaire. He's this, not a billionaire. Yeah, he's okay. He's this rich dude. He's a millionaire. He's a millionaire, not a billionaire. But he is a space tourist and he has set a course. He set a plan in motion to send a ship manned with two people, ideally a husband and wife who are older. <laughs> um, to go do a flyby of Mars and come back. And uh, the first date that the, that the window opens to actually do a good short flyby is 2016, uh, but that's too soon, he says. So uh, he set a date for January 2018 for launch of a, a mission with two astronauts to go fly around Mars and come back. And so um, here's, the, uh, here's the commentary from, from Jim. Everyone else out there, I'm sure you have your own opinions or you are developing them right now as I speak. So Jim says, this whole idea is ludicrous, but for some reason people are taking this seriously. My opinion is that this is just a money-raising scam. Here's some of my questions. And as to money raising, yes, Dennis, uh, Dennis Tito is going to be uh, fundraising to, he's putting up a lot of the initial money of his own money, but he's going to be fundraising to make up the difference. Uh, first, he says, flight in 2018, that's only five years away. Better get started raising money and building your craft. It's been estimated that each Apollo landing cost $18 billion in 2010 dollars uh, and a lot of engineers. My comment back on that is um, the lifter, uh, sure, NASA doesn't really have anything going at the moment, but there is the, the Falcon 9, and there are, um, other, there are a number of private companies who are developing uh, space craft at this time. So I don't know if it would be big enough but, uh, or comfortable, but it, 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 there are possibilities out there. Who knows if five years is enough time to get going, but by putting the money in it, and jump-starting it, the possibility of it happening is better than not 
doing that at all. Mm. And even though, and, and when you talk about an Apollo landing, you're talking about something landing. Um, in this case, they're not landing. I mean, this is going to be less expensive than the, uh, the Mars Curiosity mission. We're not sending something in such a way that it has to land and survive a landing and, and do be work a robot on the surface. in a functioning laboratory, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Uh, yeah. Living quarters, in some sense, I guess, would be easier. You have living quarters. You have to maybe deal with radiation, but <laughs> that's why I think Dennis Tito is hoping for older, an older that's married not, couple. No, <laughs> They're maybe why. out of child-rearing years. No, that's not <laughs> why. The reason is he's looking for a couple who's got a good history of being together, being supportive of each other, being uh, because they're going to be alone in space for a really long time. Yes. And they need to be two people who know each other, trust each other, love each other, and, and we'll each other get fun. along for a really long road trip. <laughs> really long road trip. This is like this is going to be like a really small RV road yeah. trip. Which, which I and think that's a great question. It's like, honey, would you for like what? What two years is it? Four yeah, years? Yeah, two years. Small RV. Is it two years there and two years back? Is it four years? No, it's uh the the whole trip would be five hundred ten days. So it's okay. about almost two years. A year and a half, almost two years. So uh, isn't there a whole issue? Sorry to interrupt, but isn't there a whole yeah, issue with um? Interrupt. You're part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there an issue with being out in space that long and it affecting your muscle tone and your bones and all this kind of More stuff? So sending muscle. an elderly couple into space <laughs> for, to affect their muscle tone and their we'll come bones come back with Jello. That seems yeah. like a mistake to me. <clears throat> but but they're not talking like older. Old. They're talking like uh, not age. really interested in in having more kids probably right I but don't. still probably more fragile when it comes yeah. to being in space for two years and I don't think that's back. the big question I think you the would big come question back is, more fragile for sure I yeah. think the big yeah. question is can you stand being with one other person uh, in close quarters for almost two years that would be the, the hardest thing I think people in order to be the people who went on the first human manned trip to Mars and back, mm -hmm. maybe not landing, but just going there and coming back, yeah. I think people would totally say, I do not care about the radiation. I do not care about the muscle wasting. I do not care about my bones getting brittle. I want to be that person. As long as I come back and you take care of me when I come back. <laughs> you know? I mean, I think there are people who will totally give up you know, future health or longevity to have that life experience to be those people. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's fantastic bragging rights, but the actual trip itself <laughs> is, is being, that experience is going to be two years in a capsule looking out a window hoping you don't hit a pebble. <laughs> it's going to be peeing into a, a vacuum sealer. It's going to be eating out of a tube it's going to, you know, the actual experience, once you, you're you up there. Um, It'll get really boring really fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and, and even the married couple, like, you're thinking, well, you know, it's going to be one long conjugal visit, right? Um, <laughs> it's going to, it's very difficult without gravity to, there's, I mean, you need to, and then afterwards also, I mean, if you've ever seen when they've accidentally spilled something, in space, it's not like you want to have juices freed up. Where are you going with this? This is not even... What is this conversation you're having? <laughs> it's about sex know. in space. It's going to be much more difficult and less appealing than people think. And I think... So, I mean, it might ruin uh, future space <laughs> travel if we allow sex in space uh, to be sort that, of... I the, think this question has been dealt with and you know, people have written about this. There are books... I think they sell them at NASA gift shops. Sure, but I anyway, mean, I think that this is the size, this is... The, the size of the living area, how big it is, uh -huh. waste disposal, you know, how comfortable, it, how how big is it going to be? He, uh, Jim asks if we have enough data from the ISS and previous craft to estimate how big it would have to be. And I'm sure we have enough data to estimate that. It's just whether or not we have anything under development currently that could actually match what. Uh, would be ideal. 
Um, getting it off the ground, Jim says, Skylab was launched in 1973 using one of the last Saturn V rockets. We don't have anything of that size anymore. This only put Skylab into Earth orbit. You need considerable more energy, he says, I think it's 20 times, I don't really remember, to have that much mass escape Earth's gravity. Has anyone figured out the amount of thrust and cost a launch vehicle requires? Assembly in orbit before setting off to Mars would be possible, but that is a much more complex mission and would require a lot more time. Mm -hmm. Starting the mission from Earth orbit still requires you to transport a lot of fuel to the craft. So there is that issue. If it's a really big vessel, then you're going to need a really big rocket. Um, so it, it probably, I mean, I'm thinking about things that are in development that I know of right now, and they're not going to be really big. And so whoever's going to go, it's like going to be, you're going to be in like a Bambi Airstream right. <laughs> flying yeah. through space for two years. <laughs> in fact, in fact, unless they come up, uh, they may spend so much money getting you up there, it may actually be a small Winnebago. Right. It may be actually what you're traveling in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Joy. That sounds exciting. Um, Jim also asks, scientific purpose. I don't see any real value of this mission other than finding out if the two passengers could survive and how much damage was done to their bodies by weightlessness and radiation. Mm -hmm. Just to have two humans fly past Mars, look out the window and say, gee whiz, doesn't seem to justify the time and energy. We are learning a lot more from the Mars orbiter and the rovers than this mission would ever provide. Well, I do think seeing what would happen to a human is a valuable thing to see. And also the psychological, of, I mean, yes, scientifically that. And I'm going beyond, I'm going to go beyond the scientific merit of what data we would collect on the people and, um, you know, their experience, what happens to their bodies physiologically. Um, the psychological effect on humanity to know that we are capable and right now, within five years, you know, this brief window, just be like, we're going to do this to get people to Mars. Not landing necessarily, but we can get them there and we can get them back and they're still mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. So we have the technology, we have the wherewithal. And, you know, this is like Justin's always saying, Mars Fest destiny. You know, it is getting humanity off of this little tiny rock and getting us to look even more into the universe at our place. We're not just, he we're not, we don't just need to be here on this planet. We can jump off and, and to be able to psychologically slam that into people's heads. I think that is incredibly valuable. Yeah, and it took, you know, we, we did, uh, we got a lot of momentum behind the space movement by putting pilots on the moon. Yeah. You know, we didn't and put a geologist. Having... We didn't put a geologist. The first geologist in space is is probably, you know, the rover or, or Curiosity. Even. I mean, yeah. those are the first <laughs> the first geologists to land on a, on a on another body were robots. Um, this isn't, this really isn't, I don't think, the scientific mission. Um, this is yeah. the, the cultural mission. And so, yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah. Great idea. I, I think I think China's going to beat us to it because they're going to put a 747 full of people on the planet and just hope that they sort it out. <laughs> like, I think somebody's just going to go for it and be like, you know what? We're sending people. This mission may not work out. We'll send another one behind it. We'll keep trying until, you know, until something sticks, right? Right. Um, that sounds like fun, though. Like it sounds like fun thing to, to it's like bragging rights for a whole planet, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm just trying to imagine like the ISS uh, people the the astronauts up on the space station right now, they they do Google Plus hangouts. Mm -hmm. They do, you know, broadcasts on YouTube and um, they have all sorts of contact with people on the planet. Now, going to Mars, at first you would be able to do that, but you, the time it would take, the co the communications delay would get greater and greater and greater as you get closer to Mars. And so eventually you would just be doing little, you know, podcast broadcasts or you would be, be answering rough, people's questions yeah. or, you know. You'd have to do it all tape delay too because it's an yeah. eight-minute delay uh, currently with Mars. Yeah. That's pretty, yeah, that's pretty big. But you could, you know, you could Skype 
We've done a lot of awkward <laughs> Awkward silences. pauses. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go make a sandwich while you answer that question I asked. I'll be back. Well, because wouldn't it be a 16-minute wait in between things? Because it would yeah. take eight minutes for it to get there. And eight, minutes to, eight minutes for it to get back. I, I don't know. It might be four and four. I, I'd have to go look that up. I'm not no, really I sure. Think I, I think it's closer to 16. It, okay. Would it be 16 round trip? Because, yeah, because yeah, the mo a motion you do when controlling the rover uh, takes eight minutes to for it to actually... Uh, to get so, there. But then I guess... Oh, age. I guess that's right. I guess that's right. <laughs> minute delay. Although that could be nice. I mean, I've thought about putting myself on more than, you know, like a year delay. Yeah. You know? Like, the I could watch all the movies on Netflix, like, would all be current all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, sequester myself away. Just like, nothing before 2011, or after 2011, she'll enter this house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to say something. I completely forgot what it was. Oh, well. But it, you know what? Not that it doesn't matter, Kirsten, but we have reached the end of the show. I think we may have, we have. reached We've it a while over. ago. Yeah. yeah. I think it's good. Uh, thank you, fun. everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is available as a podcast. You can Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid in the Android Marketplace or on your iPhone Marketplace. We are Twist, T-W-I-S. And for more information on anything that you've heard here tonight, show notes will be available eventually on our website, twist.org. So head on over there to find out what we've talked about and to access the latest episodes, almost. Additionally, we want to hear from you, so email us. I'm Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. That guy over there is Justin at thisweekinscience.com. And that awesome animal lady, that's BlairBaz at gmail.com. Yes, you can also contact us. Uh, oh, yeah, make sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can contact us on the Twitter, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson, Flyer at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that came to you in your sleep, please let us know. And we will be back here next week, and we hope that you'll join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. The end of the world, so I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Tell them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be new. That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science, you may just get understand it. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy. But this week of science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a dime Rid the world of toxoplasma, got the eye. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I want you to address From stopping global hunger 
to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought, and I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science, 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 this week in science. Nice. I stopped it. I did that. Great show, everybody. Great Fantastic, show. You know, really. it's really fun to unplug from the headphones and dance. <laughs> I find myself penned in by those walls I normally use mm -hmm. to hide the diaper genie and the rocket, radio flyer rocket. That's pretty awesome. It's really awesome. <laughs> it's really cool, actually. Wait, hold on. I gotta get... Are you ready to blast off? <laughs> All systems go, Retro! <laughs> nice. All systems go, Retro, looking good. And Pee-wee takes over the show. <laughs> hmm. I miss Pee-wee. Oh, He's a good guy. Yeah. Pee Wee Herman was a good guy. Yeah, I got to I got to meet That's him, and I didn't. I it took me a, a long time to recognize him, because Paul was, Rubens. Paul Rubens was in costume on uh, the movie Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh. And I saw I saw him in the I was uh I was, I, like he was dressed kind of like I was like are you in the vampires guy? He was like. Yeah, that part. You know, it was just like random, another vampire guy. It's like, cool, whatever. And then I'm like, watch him later. I'm like, oh my god, that, <laughs> that could have been like gushing, and I missed my opportunity. You're my hero. I really, I based my whole life off of you, showing your sensibilities and such. But anyway, it's probably the best that that I still make sound effects when I cook because of him. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Whenever I pour anything into anything. Whoop. <laughs> I wonder if that's where my sound... No. I was making sound effects long before Pee Wee Herman. So uh, Ed from Connecticut is talking about there is a Twist Minion hangout that takes place. It yeah, takes on place... Tuesdays now, right? When does, it take... when does it happen? It takes place while I'm working, so I'm not there, which is probably good because you're all free to talk. It's just a Minion <laughs> hangout. <laughs> There's room for other people to speak when I'm not present in these hangouts, apparently. What time um, on Tuesdays, everyone? We can... What time is the Tuesday uh, Minion Hangout Arama taking Hello, place? Hello, baby. Tuesdays in the evening at some point, people are... Those are jammies. <laughs> He's wearing jammies. Are you going to show my butt on TV? What are you doing? <laughs> oh! 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which, if I'm correct, is 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific. On the Pacific time. You are correct, hmm. sir. I wonder. Hmm. I'm making my own. Last hangout lasted three hours? Three hour minion hangout. You guys are awesome. You're you guys like... are totally rad. You're trying to do Twist Mageddon every Tuesday. I know. Like, they like, <laughs> beat the show and the after show time. I love it. Okay, I'm totally scared. Wait, Kirsten, this is—I'm a little bit nervous. 
How do people get involved in this? What if we get hangout? replaced? What if they're like, yeah, we got our own show now. We're we're good. We're, Thank you, Identity we Four. To, You're awesome. We don't need the, the twist thing. We got our own show. We're doing three hours a week. We're getting more oh, science right. in it. Right. I think that's totally awesome. Three hour minion hangout. Is it was it recorded anywhere? Is it, can I go watch it? Or is it like? No. Secret Society handshakes. Stuff. Oh, Ed was asking though. He wanted. He was talking about setting up a. Uh, it's not a minion hangout thing, but Science Island. He was asking about setting up a Science Island brand page on Google Plus, and then also YouTube, and being able to nice. do like hangouts on air that would um, be recorded for posterity and do other Science Island content and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. My experience was very easy. I had, I mean, you just go fill things out in Google and you say, I'm a brand or whatever. And it was, mm -hmm. for me, it was really no problem. I don't know what it would be um, like for you. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, I love this idea. <laughs> and I want to jump in with uh, both feet and participate in it, but I can't right now. But I'm about a month away. It, I'm from, I've got this. Double secret thing going on that I may be having a very different gig in about a month. Oh, it's not a clothing store, is it? No, no, I'm never gonna have a meat space or anything. No, um, You're not selling jeans again. No, I've got this. I, not I applied even for online. This, I applied for this job for a sciencey company, and it looks like I'm, I'm, in, I'm. If they do this expansion -y thing, which there's supposedly sound ever all the feedback I'm getting is it's gonna I hope happen. you used all these words in your interview, sciencey and expansion -y. Yeah, I did. I was like, I'm really into sciencey stuff and like you know, like science is cool. <laughs> so I wanna like, you know, do some science stuff with you, you know, you're totally but it's uh, supposedly I'm hired contingent on this expansion thing happening. And all the feedback mm. is the expansion thing is going to happen, but we're still... Right. But you never know. Knowing for way. sure, for sure, because there's... A, you know, well, if it's a fancy job, my fingers, are, my fingers are crossed for you. Yeah. I hope that works out. Um, Ed from Connecticut asked, how do you record hangouts? Um, one, if you just want to record audio, um, I use uh, Wiretap, which is a program to record audio. You can just record um, whatever system audio or whatever. Um, if you want to do audio and video, there are some great programs out there. Cam Twist is one that uh, a lot of people, or ManyCam, ManyCam or Cam Twist, I think, are, are programs that people use to record if you want to record locally. Um, and uh, Ed from Connecticut is hoping Science Island webpage and recorded Hangouts by April. Awesome. But if you are doing a Hangout on air, if you, uh, which every, anyone can do now, uh, Google has opened up Hangouts on air for anyone, and I think that includes brand pages also. If you do a Hangout on air, it will automatically be... Uh, recorded and saved down to the YouTube page of uh, your account. So say, Ed, you have your personal Google account um, and you, you create a Science Island brand. Um, you can, uh, within your profile or down the sidebar, it allow, it had, there are like more options and you can see your pages. And so your brand, Science Island, will be one of your pages and it gives you the option to switch to your brand page to be like working through Google Plus as that identity. And so if you go through that path and start a hangout from the Science Island brand page, then it should put the, um, it, it's, it's questionable as to whether or not it will put the, uh, the Science Island hangout on your own page or whether it'll be on a Science Island page. The only reason, like I had an old This Week in Science account, and so I, ha I had some trouble splitting my personal account from 
uh, the This Week in Science personality. So um, what I would suggest you do is not use your personal account, but like try and create an alter ego or something. <laughs> create another Google email address with a fa fake identity. Don't say I ever said that. No, that's good <laughs> This advice. is not being recorded. And then, um, so you're not using your personal Google uh, Gmail account and you have, you have, yeah, don't make it personal, make it all Science Island-y, like do scienceisland at gmail.com, make Science Island the brand page. You're going to have to, because of Google profiles and with the way those are set up, the brand page, yeah, anyway, you'll be able to, you'll be able to do it. It's, it's pretty easy. It's straightforward as long as you don't associate it with your email account. As long as you try and separate them, it gets, it's better. So anyway, and then if it's on your YouTube brand channel, hang out on air, deposits it right there. They're saved there for posterity. You have um, embed codes, and then if you have a web page, you just put the embed code in your web page, and there you go. So it seems very straightforward when I'm talking about it, but when it actually comes to uh, doing it, it takes a lot longer. <laughs> much longer than I want it to. Science Island adjacent. Yes, Mark 8675. That's awesome. Yeah, Hot Rod Audacity is good for audio. Uh, and for both audio and video, I, I have, uh, if you're, you, I have uh, Cam, Cam Twist? Is that what I have? I'm pretty sure. I have ManyCam, and I think ManyCam is better for PC than it is for Mac. So if you're running PC, ManyCam currently has a much better, uh, much better aspects to it. And no, I don't have Cam Twist, but Cam Twist is another one that you could use. ManyCam is great because it's not very expensive. Camtasia, that's a good one too. Yes, thank you, Gord. Camtasia. <laughs> Pamela and Arnlor, why are you asking me questions? They know everything. <laughs> I know nothing. And Janiscu says that you had some audio problems on the Twist Minion Hangout. See? I am not alone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me with the audio problems. I think Blair's asleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, Miss 5 a.m. Yeah. Oh boy. I'm glad you're back. And I'm going I seriously I'm going to uh, I'm going to buy a new thing and sell this thing and have a better ability to do two microphones. Um so moving. Official moving week is the first week of April. I'm moving to a new house. Ooh. Congratulations. Yeah, first week of April. So, Thursday of that week, I probably, it might be difficult for me, <laughs> but we'll see. I might be able to do just, you know, throw on a headset. I don't I don't know if I'll have internet. I might have to come to your house, Blair. Okay. <laughs> yeah, or I might be moving that day, depending on when I get um, the movers. Let's both crash Justin's house. Yeah. Yeah, I know. You guys can drive my house anytime. I'll drive. Yeah. <laughs> we know he has a good microphone, so. Yeah, I think it would pick up all of us uh, at the same time because it's mm -hmm. not connected to my head. I do think it'd be fun to do a show the three of us in one place. I think I think it would be. Have fun. have we never done that, or has no. that ever? Nope. No. Is that right? Because, so all the times when, even at the Twit Studio. Yep. That was just you and me. Kiki wasn't there. Wow. I did. It was me and Justin, and then uh -huh. it was Justin and Blair, uh -huh. and... Then you and Blair once, right? And, and then Blair and me, yeah. That's crazy. It has never been all three of us in one place <laughs> at one time. So. It's not right. That can't be right. Is that really? That's it's true? It's totally right. Oh, that's so funny. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're not... Maybe it's not supposed to happen. 
<laughs> it's like having the uh, the president, Crossing vice president, is... and what secretary of state in one room. At the You've same always got to have somebody in an undisclosed <laughs> safe location. Yeah, uh, Janisku, Ed, for your hangout uh, for the Twist Minions, if people want to want to hang out with you on Tuesdays at six p.m. Eastern time, what do they look for? It's in Google Plus, right? Google Plus Hangouts. Oh, you know what I forgot to talk about? The uh, Twist Minion Hangout. What are you calling it? The camera and the football. Oh, I thought you were going to say the resignation of the Pope. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ha, 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 ha. What was I going to say? Eat. Oh, holy quit. He put... <laughs> Never mind. Twist community G plus. Okay, Ed says G plus Twist community. Okay, so there's the community page, right? You go to the community page. Is that where you go? Oh, I haven't been there. We have to wait for the eight minute delay. He's on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> R and Laura has shared to Twist group called Twist Minion Hangout. It's calling it the Twist Community. There's the Twist Community page, which, if in case people didn't know about that, there's the uh, G Plus Twist Community page. Now, hmm, Identity Four, awesome. You go the expensive route and record with Ableton Live. I like it. I like it. Is a good. Ed from King, right, community page. First link didn't work. Okay. Sweet. So if you go to the community page, probably share the hangout on the community page, and if people are interested, you can get involved. Mm. Do, 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 do. Right. <laughs> you also produce music. Exactly. So you've got the you've got the software. Mm. I want to get the uh, the new what you might call it the new yes. what is it called? I think they're still calling the what you call it the what you call it Pro Tools something thingy. Pro Audio Tools ten what's it thingy? Who's the what's it? It looks really super awesome. This thingamajig. Yeah. <laughs> is it Pro Audio? Pro Audio Pro, Tools. Pro 10. Tools. Pro Audio. Yeah. Pro Tools, yeah, that's the Pro one. Tools, the thingamajig. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the thing I want. That's the thing with I want. <sighs> Don't mind me. I'm just gonna. Mm. Oh, I just saw a comment <laughs> on our Google Plus. Hello, Scott Lewis. You are funny, Scott Lewis, who has uh, been who who joined us during Twist Mageddon. A lot of fun talking about astronomy stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. He he commented in the comments when you were talking about um, the otter bacula. Mm. He said Blair's bringing the penises, but who's bringing the titty sprinkles? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that's, that's not the technical term. Oh, no. <laughs> Super fun. Okay, so it's almost 9.30. We've done a little after show. We've had, had a little fun with a little twist. It's time to go. It's time to go. Had a little fun. Did a little twist. It's time to go. It's time to go. Are you, are you, are you ready to go? No, no, no. I'm just going to hang out. You guys I'm can go. go. Yeah. You, you can stick out. You got I things leave. to do. You got places to be. You got sleep dreams. I'm just going to be here. Uh, Look, like she's sinking lower and lower go. in that chair. <laughs> I'm going to go get my guitar. I'm going to wish that I had something to record oh, on. That's nice. And I'm going to sit here and rock her out until the wee early morning, until the sun comes up. Well, I think. What you're going to want to do for your rocking out is start your own hangout. Because if I hang up 
to hold things out. Mm, that's right. Got a little mm -hmm. nick. Mm. Okay, so so I'm just gonna sit before you can go, <laughs> but before you do, Blair. Yes, sir. You promise me, <laughs> sir. <laughs> what the hell? That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, <laughs> that may be the meanest oh, no, thing anybody didn't. has said to me in a really long time. I just like to see how you'd react. Even the kids at the school today, even this little kindergartner, little kindergarten kid looked at me because I, I pretended when we had to staple their work together at the end, and of course I pretended to staple my hand to one of them. I was like, ah, ah shaking around, I couldn't get it off. <laughs> oh dear! Me, and he goes. You're a clown. <laughs> You're a clown. <laughs> yeah, yeah kind of. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you were saying. Yeah, yeah. You uh, promised me that we we're gonna hang out, and like, I... and as soon as you were back, you're like, "It's on. We're gonna go to the late hours. Yeah. Late night after show. Orama." And now you're like, eh, I got to sleep. I'm discovering that when I hit a quarter century a while back, and now I'm past that, I my body is not as elastic as it once was. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like in college, you know, where you could stay up two nights in a row, and, you know, the first night go out and party, and then the second night, pull an all-nighter and write a 20-page essay, and then the third night, go back out again. No, I can't do that. You can't. I mean, you couldn't stay up all night, late at night, drink ring, then the next morning, pick up a sick kid who didn't go to school and keep her entertained all day, and then stay up late night drinking with some buddies that night, and then wake up early and go teach a bunch of kids from school, and then hang out with a couple of kids all day, running around, uh, playing baseball and throwing the football around, and Get it together to put a show together to do to do that while drinking and uh, stay up late afterwards and talk to people and still keep going. At 25, you've lost that. Well, I, I've lost it. <laughs> well, Blair, also, you are funny. <laughs> it's just I read today how not getting six hours sleep multiple nights in a row up to mm -hmm. a week alters your genes. Yep. Yes. Yep. It makes it makes your next generation leaner, meaner. No. 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 It adjusts your. It adjusts your, it adjusts it your clock. People say things like, "Oh, it changes your genes." Like, "Oh, like I'm gonna grow a third arm." It doesn't change. Maybe it's for the better. Maybe your genes are like, you know what? You know what? This uh, this particular uh, individual does not sleep and drinks a lot of beer. And what we're, we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to extract more of the water from the beer than that we typically would bother. And by the way, when he sleeps. Let's make it the sleep of angels because it's all we're getting, right? You know, I think that's the alteration that takes place in the genes. It's a, the genes trying to catch up with what the body is doing. Mm. That's why, at least, I'd like to think that's what's happening. Yeah, you go ahead, keep thinking that. <sighs> I'm gonna look this up. It's just every day now. It's like I've pulled an all-nighter because I'm yeah. awake the entire time yeah. I'm supposed to be asleep. UK then... study. Here it is. Here it is. Mm -hmm. oh. but... I just read a story about you know how to how to how to how to identify BS about science on the internet if it comes from something that you don't really know. Red alert politics. What? Mm -hmm. Anyway, you oh, that, top that, that, news Arab Emirates UK study finds sleep de deprivation causes gene mutation. Mm -hmm. Okay, is wait, that wait. from this week? I saw something from this week about it. Mm. Oh, there's a review of findings from 2002. This goes way back. Oh, it hampers. It hampers. It doesn't cause gene mutation. It hampers gene activity. See, headlines from stupid places. Hold on a second. I'm so Ed from it. Connecticut is uh, asking in the chat room. I posted some pictures about making beer that I'd get to drink it. Not yet, but I. The last this week, I've been working very hard to empty the keg. <laughs> that that beer is going into. <laughs> we, we spent the last few nights uh, arduously drinking this sort of chocolate malt uh, dark beer that we made uh, previously to clear the, the kegs for when this beer is ready to, to keg. Okay, so I have two very important questions. Mm -hmm. 
one. What kind of beer is it? Beer. Oh, the beer that we uh, we made is a uh, what is it called? A Kolsch. It's like a it's like a light, mm-hmm. lighter, mm-hmm. very hoppy, Kulsch, very yeah. crisp. Um, so you know, so maybe. number two, my question mm-hmm. number two. Mm-hmm. I can has beer. <laughs> if you can cans come Davis, you cans have all you wants. <laughs> is, is, is. <laughs> I love homemade beer. It's always good. Yeah, we we keg it in the kegerator. We have bottles, but we haven't bottled the beer in a really long time. But maybe I can I can find a way to get one bottle for you. I don't know if I've missed the because usually we then it ferments in the bottles the way we usually do it. I think so. It's I might have missed the opportunity. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe we can. I'll figure it That's out. All right, party at Justin's house, everybody. <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, just you know, <laughs> until I get tired, so, I, I may fall asleep mid conversation. That's usually how it. So Blair, that's how it happened on Twistmageddon, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, you drank and you passed. One moment. Out. I was I, so let down by you, Justin. I know, I know. I was trying to do a beer an hour. And I think that might have been ambitious. I think you were doing more than a beer an hour at one point. I and at some point, time problem. was flying, and then you know. Yeah. Blair, sleep yes. deprivation does not cause gene mutations. It will cause changes in gene expression, uh, specifically genes that are uh, involved in chromatin. And metabolism and mm. the body's re- response to stress and immune system functions. So it will make your cells and your body less able to react to stress stressful situations. So you're more likely to get sick. And if you maintain the not sleeping for a really long time, it increases the likelihood of obesity, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, whatever, diabetes. <laughs> Yeah. So it says in this article that I'm reading from BBC News that um, they took people and had them sleep less than six hours a week for a whole, or six hours a night for a whole week. Yeah. And it said more than 700 genes were altered. So when I, the study I was looking at said only 354 genes were altered. 374 were significantly affected. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, here we go. Changes in more than 700 genes, but 374 being significantly affected, most of them showing reduced activity. Mm-hmm. So your metabolism just isn't running at full speed. So right. it's not. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of them were about building protein, it says, that were yeah. disrupted. So that's some sleep. The sleep will so help that, you. But what if that's a good thing? Like, you don't even know if it's a bad thing. It could be good for you. I'm in this very bad catch-22 because the more that I sleep when I want to sleep, the longer it takes for jet lag to fix itself, which means then when I go back to work, I'll be working with bears and things and very tired, which is not good. (laughs) That doesn't Uh, doesn't sound like a good company. Go to – I don't know if it will help you. I mean – it might help you now. I don't know if you, if it's late or whatever, but go to jetlagrooster.com. Somebody sent that to me, and it helps. Um, like it, it would su- it suggested ways for you to shift your clock so that it helps you uh, get over jet lag more quickly. Hmm. So, like basically, you need to the the key things that are involved are exposing yourself to really bright light, sunlight, sunlight ideally. Yeah. You want actually, and oddly, I've heard that you and need during sunlight during certain on the, hours, and on the back of your knees, you need sunlight. I don't, I don't know why that is in my head, but sounds like the, a joke. No, 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 no. Like really, like it's most effective if it reaches the back of that fleshy area. It's like an armpit in the back of your knee, right? Is like you need the light. I don't. Why do I? Why is that in my head? I didn't have anything on this before you started saying that stuff, uh, Kiki. And then Mooncat says they've heard the knee thing too. Okay, good. So I think that's, that's well, no, I'm just looking. I'm looking into it right now. Columbia University Science News here, 98. 
Yeah, some has a school. question. Oh. Uh, where, where, where is it? Um, yeah, yeah. So January 16th, science, Scott S. Campbell and Patricia J. Murphy of Cornell University Medical, Co Medical College in White Plains, New York, report that light focused on the backs of people's knees reset their biological clock as readily as light shone on the eyes. Damn, I'm good. I don't even know what I know. Mm. I didn't even know I knew that. <laughs> Presumably, the light is falling on some unknown photoreceptor that there that is tied into the circadian system. Researchers have suggested that light penetrates the skin and strikes blood-borne photoreceptors that convey their signals to the brain's biological clock, and that hemoglobin might even serve that role. But this is a really old article, so I don't know. There's mm. probably something newer than that, but it's interesting, right? Right? Mm. Isn't that weird? Yeah, go into bright light at certain hours. Uh, okay. I think first thing in the morning. And wear shorts. Yeah. Not here, no. I'm no telling shorts. you, that's the way. Uh, it's yeah, freezing today. I'm actually, I'm, I think that story is less weird than the fact that I remember that from like uh, that long ago. That's because that's like, what, a 15 year old story? Mm hmm. That was like even pre way pre twist. I don't know why. No, it was like at the beginning, like when Twist was getting started. Oh, yeah. sure, sure, but it was pre my involvement by a little a lot of it. So but Twist I still, did not exist before. Twist didn't exist, but I was still Twist looking for sciencey things. Yeah. No, Ed Connecticut uh, Ed from Connecticut is not a good memory. Because I don't have any control of what I remember. I don't have access to that information. But it was there. It was for some reason the information's there. I just don't have like I just didn't file anything. I put everything in like, uh, there's like a stuff file and a junk file. Mm -hmm. And then that stuff and junk, it's no other file. You go in there and then it's the whole list of documents that goes on for thousands and thousands and thousands, but there's no order <laughs> other than that. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like the card catalog was just put in there completely randomly. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's got every book in the library. Uh, but good luck looking up something when you need it, right? The Dewey Decimal System? Somebody invented that? Because we just put the books in there according to size. <laughs> we, we weigh them first and see which ones are heavier. We put lighter books, then heavier, and then we have mm -hmm. a shelf for the ones that are tall. <laughs> Okay. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm looking up a whole bunch of things for getting over jet or, lag. Or, or sleep, so maybe leave the lights on when you go to sleep tonight. Leave no. an LED light on. Do you have an LED light on? No, it's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It would be hard. like if I was yeah. napping, I should have the light on. Okay, so here's the thing. So LED lights, as somebody was converted, I think Ed was uh, posted on Science Island, can grow plants, which I didn't know, which I think is awesome, right? Um... So Some here's people what, grow weed, isn't it, with LED? Not that I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> well. So what I'm saying is, uh, if you had, I wonder if you had, when you wake up in the morning, if you had on the inside of your long pants and whatever else you got to wear because you're in San Francisco, if you had an LED light implant in your clothes, right, as you walked around, right, Hmm. If you'd be getting all the light to the photoreceptors at the back of your knee so that your body would be aware that now this is daytime and we got to reset the clock to this is morning. Isn't it? Isn't the sun on my head good enough? <laughs> it's all in your head. <laughs> it's all in your head. I don't know. Yeah, so set your, set your alarm for a, like a time in the morning tomorrow mm -hmm. and... Mm -hmm. Get up and expose yourself. Like get up and get out in the sunshine, mm -hmm. and then you know, for at least a couple of hours, and then you know whatever. If you take have to take a nap or whatever, don't worry about it. And then the next morning, set your clock back or, or the 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 alarm an hour earlier, and do the mm -hmm. same thing, and do that for like a few days. Mm. 
LED light <laughs> in your pants is what's going to save you here. <laughs> no. also, okay, Hot Justin. Rod, All right. Hot, Hot Rod does point out pot growers use $600 sun lamps. Yeah, they shouldn't. Um, uh, they also shouldn't use mylar reflective material around. These are just things that create more heat, which isn't that great for the plant and also is a dead giveaway if they're using heat sensors in your neighborhood. Okay, Abel. Uh, if they're looking for thermal release from one house versus another, they're going to find you. Uh, LED lights and no mylar. You don't need to capture more light bouncing around. It just generates more heat. It's going to screw you up. Oh, I want to go. A good sleep HEPA here. filter for the escaping air to minimize scent and maybe take up, you know, um, a lot of Indian cooking. So there's a lot of curry smell coming from your house because that will mask the scent as well. Oh, am I talking too much about? I'm just looking at a pretty room. <laughs> I want to sleep in the Poseidon Undersea Resort in Isn't Fiji. That rad? It's awesome. It's beautiful. Oh gosh. I want to go there. Let's go there now. All right. Uh, I'm going to go away. And this thing is so soon. Mm -hmm. so so Hi, Traveler. Your so flight soon. from Jerusalem, Israel to San Francisco, United States has a risk of jet lag. <gasps> really? Mm hmm. I don't really, I don't think my circadian rhythm has ever been set properly because I don't really get jet lag. Have I you don't... really lived someplace like Israel for six months and then no, had to move back? No, I didn't move to Israel, but I moved to Greenland for six weeks and had six the sun weeks. never go down. And I've gone to Denmark for months at a time. And that's like almost Arctic Circle in Europe ish. You know, like deep northern European. So like I've like that's yeah. not no, that's not the same thing. It's not the um like you're gonna have yeah, you'll have differences in like when the sun rises and sets, but it's not really like the it's not the same as going around the planet. Like you're going to Greenland is not as far as going all the way well, to Well it didn't matter because the sun never went down. Jerusalem. So there was no more day and night. It was just day. It was just. So you're just, you're just free course, running. I, I, wait, wait. Also, right. by the way, I guess I, I should. The caveat there is, I've never really had to keep that much of a schedule. Exactly. <laughs> and he was drunk the whole time. Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to seek light at nine at night? LED lights on the back of your legs. This is. Do I have to keep repeating myself? Like, are you listening? Take notes. <sighs> Hey, but right now you're awake, you're in light, you have lights on in your house, right? You're seeking yeah. light, that's Dr. Great. Justin has just given you the... Oh, by the way, that just totally reminded me. Um, there's this like, really young girl I want to interview on our show. What? Um, uh, what is her name? Somebody, uh, somebody on the, in the chat room knows who this is. Her name is like Licia Green. She does like this green show. She's like a 25-year-old Dr. Ruth. Why do I want to talk to her? Lacey Green. Thank you, Gord. Lacey Green. We need to talk to her about sex education. This is a really messed up no. thing. I consider myself a completely sexually liberated man who doesn't have to like worry about it. Like, I've never had hang-ups or like, stuff you like that. You can have your own Google Plus hang But this 25-year-old girl knows more about sex than... I do, and I'm like older than her. It's kind of disturbing. But she's got like she's doing um, YouTube videos uh, that are sex education, and they're right. You can go you can, before you shoot it down, Kirsten. You should go look at it because you might see it and say, "Oh yeah, I should just trust Justin's opinion because he's never let me down before." Um, I think she'd be a good guest to talk about what science. Is she working at Discovery now? I didn't know she worked for Discovery. That's She's awesome. not working at Discovery. She's working for Revision 3. Whatever, whoever. However. So you know, oh, you know who it is. is. You I know don't exactly like her. who it is. No. You don't like her. I'm just bitter. You're bitter? <laughs> no, I know. No, she's also like her show is way crisper, cleaner. She's got effects and stuff for good. No, it's awesome. Yeah, I was totally jealous the whole time I was watching it. But <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm no, I'm just like, bitter because there are young people out there willing to take less of a paycheck than I require. So. Okay, well that that's there, but there's also like I <laughs> young think young YouTube stars who have yet to become created. I'm a, I'm a little <laughs> 
<laughs> wish I knew that much about sex at 25. I mean, you know, I thought I was doing well, but still, I would love, I would love to talk to her about um, sex education. Now, I think she's. You got... can have your own interview with her. Why it's don't you want to talk to her? Twist. Get past. It's get not going to happen on twist. Oh, what does it have? Right, what sciencey so. thing does it? Have? Well, Sex education versus like Tennessee's abstinence laws. I would love to have her on to talk about that, because I think she is the, the this generation's closest thing to a Dr. Ruth. It's great. She can be sci sex education y Dr. Ruthy. People go if you're watching, go watch Lacey Green and her YouTube channel. She's awesome. She's not gonna fit as an interview on Twist. Sorry, <laughs> it's not gonna happen. <laughs> Tell me about the science, scientific research that she's going to discuss, and then we'll get to it. Well, I mean, if we if we can have some of our better guests have been science news journalists, Carl Zimmer. Who talk about science. Yeah. Who talk about science. <laughs> I, I, I bet you if we said this is the science-y subject that we want to talk about, she wouldn't have any problem. But that's fine. That's fine. It's, you don't have to. You're giving me a meme. I'm so glad that we are not. This is actually the real reason me and Kirsten are not in the same room. Because there, I just I just skipped about four or five shin kicks. That would have been coming. The first, the first one, you always think she was just stretching a leg, right? Bam! <laughs> Okay, she's adjusting <laughs> her suit. The second one, oh wow, I guess the first uh, no, reset so <laughs> of her seating position didn't work out. She reset again. I got another bam, but that look was uh that was one of those I think that's the look I saw when you busted those boards to get your black belt. <laughs> that's the same. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I really lost a leg there. Wow. That was a bigger reaction than I expected from... I thought you wouldn't have even known who I... But you know exactly who I was... I <laughs> what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but you would have accepted a smaller check at 25 than, at, you know... Sure, 30. at 25? Absolutely. Yeah. But now that you're 30, you're like, eh, way too bad. You could take a good one. Yeah, with a lot more experience and... Yeah. Heck yeah. That's why I don't have a job. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. I know. Well, none of us have jobs. I mean, yeah. except for Blair. Yeah, no, I don't I really have a job either. I refuse oh, to be taken advantage of by companies that don't want to pay people what they're worth. Any. That's what I've been doing my whole life too. But I think that's any, working uh, in general. I think that's all work. I need to be respected with a paycheck. That oh my God! Really? <laughs> you want respect and money? See, what I've learned oh, yeah. from my time in life is you can choose I to do. have the paycheck, or you can choose to have. No, no, respect. no! I've done that. I've it's done that. Not, you can't do both. I don't think. No, it's no. Possible. If somebody's not going to pay you what you're worth, they don't respect you, and that's what I've learned. And I'm not going to do it ever again. And I will not have a job until I am paid as much as I'm worth. Ever. <laughs> maybe, maybe. No, no, I don't get respect at work, ever. Like, that's not when I work, though. I mean, work is for pizza and beer. Um, mm -hmm. What I do here isn't for pizza and beer. Sometimes it is. You get a microphone every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. I mean... Seven years in. I've bought you pizza and beer before. Come on. Oh, well, yeah, that too. Yeah. No, no, you're right. Okay. So, everything. Oh, good gracious. So, okay. So then we're going to have to have one of those other meetings when we have to talk about, quite seriously, how we sell out properly. Right. Oh, one of those questions. We could join. I, I'd love to hear you guys. Twist Minions, you got to talk about this. Um, I need to contact a company called Art13, Art17. They are a podcast company, a startup down in Los Angeles, and um, they do, you know, they've got a bunch of big-name comedians in, uh, signed up to them, and 
I think the way that their licensing works, if you sign up with them, is that uh, like the first podcast episode, the most recent episode comes out for free, maybe with advertising on it, and then everything else after that goes behind a paywall. And so you have to pay to be a part of their service. Like it's their mm -hmm. um, more uh, premium service to be able to access older episodes. Uh, so I, uh, what is it? The skepticality, not skepticality, um, skeptically speaking, is it Chris Mooney and Indre Viscontis from the, uh, the Skeptics Society, their podcast, um, they have signed up with them, and there are other podcasts that are signing up with them, and I'm just wondering if this would be something worth doing, or if it would piss people off. You know, and I don't want to lose our community, because that is okay. the most important mm -hmm. thing to right. me. Right, right, right. So, so that I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, I, I think we should do it 100%, because our community has already hold, heard all our old bullshit. These are our old, this is we have our old school community. They're already mm -hmm. here. They're here. They're strong as hell. They're not going away. You don't have to buy the old episodes. They already have them downloaded already. <laughs> they and don't care anymore. Um, we, now I we're mean, going. New out. listeners, they don't know any better. Yeah, those are just <laughs> marks at this point. If you haven't found the show by then, you're a you're a mark. You're you're a rube. You're a sucker born every minute. <laughs> Sucker MCs. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't talked with them, so I don't know, you know, what they would say about the whole, you know, the way we broadcast through Google Plus, and it's all on it YouTube, and it's free, all out there free sorry. anyway, just not as a podcast. Yeah, yeah so. Not, we can't pay. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, send me emails. Let me know your comments, everyone out there. I, I've heard I've Justin's in. <laughs> so, I don't care. Should we do it? Should we sign up with a company who will take care of things like Finding us new listeners, maybe. Yeah, I know, but we always, whenever we find a new pimp, it's just like the old pimp, isn't it? Like, isn't it always that way? It's like, they say they're not going to hit us. He's going to treat us right, but then he takes out the bag of oranges. Right, and then we go, or we sit in, we sit in the pimp chair, and we're like, oh, this is a cool chair. And they're like, no one sits in the pimp chair. It's like, oh, I didn't know this was a big deal. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I think what would be what we the best solution, of course, is the hardest one to achieve uh, always. But I think just winning the lottery and not having to give a fuck about money and just you know doing the show like more days a week would just be awesome. But I mean, that's that's like you know, that's the that's the fantasy. It's like we could do this every day. Like this is how we end every day. It is like mm -hmm. we do this. We bring more than more of the minions on as as like uh, satellite anchors to do stories. We bring more right. and more guests on. I love that. Uh, we turn it into a community thing, and we don't have to worry about the money thing because we're all living on silence, Science Island, <laughs> and <laughs> and don't have to have these like meat space jobs where we go and put up with other people's BS. But but but. Not living in that world. I think what we're doing is pretty awesome. I'm, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm stoked with the way it is, too. Me More too. of the same or change? Either one, I don't care. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, how well it sells branch. Let me figure out what the name of it. Let me see. I think it'd be really Yarn, great if Yarn, we could if, do if we could do snippets from the show, like small segments, yeah, and send them out on radio or some totally sort of TV agree. outlets. The PB, this wait, right, 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 right over here in my filing cabinet. This is totally <laughs> random. And this guy right here said that he would uh, do that if we could come up with like you know minute and a half video. two minute segments. Video this and video. It has to yeah, but he also be said that uh, the Quest people were looking for stuff like that for the KGO folks. Well, do they have a studio we could use? Mm. Probably not. Probably not. Because if, if we could find a place where we, they had a studio that we could use for an hour a week, go in, film a couple things, be done, that would be really easy. Studio? We don't need a studio. Like, we... we We've got the world at our disposal. We well, live in if California. If we want to put it on on uh, 
public broadcasting television, I feel like it has to be top notch quality. They don't put Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not But I do feel access. like there's a very good chance they have a set laying around that they're not using for an hour at some point during the week that we, you can just walk great, in and use. Here, let me hand you this. Actually, you know what? I I'm gonna submit this information to you via my mouse. Everyone, it's Art19, Art19, and it's a startup if you want to check out the company. Well, the, the guy I talked to there who says he's the vice president of content creation at the KVI PBS Public Broadcasting says they oh, do a lot of these works. like outdated community announcements and boring public yeah. announcement junk because they don't have anything interesting to plug in for those couple of minutes between shows when they would otherwise have dead air. So they want... Excuse me. Good content, uh, something interesting to put up there, more interesting than what they've got. They would gladly put it up there, but they don't have any budget for it. Right. So, where is this? San Jose? Uh, this is Sacramento. For, Sacramento. Yeah. Well, if if you guys wanted somebody to do footwork, I certainly have a lot of free time right now. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to. Well, and I could look into it if uh, if we could find yeah. a studio space to use. We don't even need a big studio space. I mean, it's uh, that, well, actually I have lights that, and she's cameras right. and all sorts of stuff. You have light and lights stuff. and cameras. Mm -hmm. It would just be a matter of setting things up. Setting it up. Mm -hmm. But then okay. it depends on what we're even talking about. Because if you're talking about a sciencey thing, just watching us talk might not be that interesting. Exactly. Our minions it love has it. To be, it has to be set up, especially for like a right. two-minute thing. It has to right. be yeah, scripted. We would have to do it, it has to be. Well, I, I think you could very easily pick a news story from mm -hmm. science news from the week, and pick an element from the news story that you might need to explain to the common man, mm -hmm. and then from that you can do some sort of illustrative thing that would be the background and then the story. I think. I think it's it's something that could be done. Mm -hmm. With you know, you could use visual aids to your advantage. You could use um, art or uh, like biofacts, or you could use like um, charts and graphs. You could do plenty of things. I think that would benefit from the visual medium that you could use to do you know a minute of explanation on a topic and then a minute of the news story from that week that's related to it. You know, I think I think it's something that you could do very easily. It would just take some doing. Take some time. All right. Or we could just do public uh, service announcements about, like, Toxoplasma Gandhi. <laughs> no, really. I mean, like, think of it that way. Because the, the, the problem I had with it, it, it is doing what we do, which is this week's story, right, the breaking mm -hmm. news kind of stuff, is creating, getting graphics together, charts and everything else, the visuals to go along with the story that you then run... And it costs you, a, you know, $1,000 a minute. So it's like a $2,000 an episode, whatever, to produce. And then it runs for a week or two weeks, maybe three weeks. And then it's useless. Versus the, by the way, do you know about Toxoplasma Gondii? This thing that you could run infinitum at mm -hmm. the same budget that could always get play. So... Well, we could definitely do both too. I think I think right. it might be nice though to to do something that ties into our current show, so that it could act doubly and then also be um, mm -hmm. an advertisement for right. our show. It, the it main wouldn't be an advertisement, mm -hmm. and it would exactly. bring in so many new listeners and disagree. viewers. Disagree. Disagree. I think what I think what the point of creating this two minute segment for something like a KVIE, right, for public broadcasting, wouldn't be a connection to this show as much as it would be a pilot for people saying, I like what I just keep seeing in that little two-minute thing. I wish it was like a whole half hour or 24 minutes I could tune into to watch this. Um, it's more creating... It could be both. It could be both. It's, it's an perfect. advertisement for what we do, and it's also... For a pilot for yeah. uh, a show. So being able to have something that has more staying power and get played more and get used more for months, for a year, two year, three years down the road to see your segment getting played means that there's, you're still promoting the idea of a pilot for the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'd yeah, have, to come, think, have think... to come up with something interesting because right now I know that I, I, don't, I don't know about PBS, but I know that major networks, cable networks, nobody's doing talk shows, nobody's doing science magazine shows. 
Nobody's buying them right now at right. all. At well, all. that means there's an empty niche. <laughs> right. I mean, look at how many. Yeah. And I, 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 I apologize for cursing. Look at how much blither blather. All right, there I did it. Look how much blither blather there is in the in the public airways about politics. What a what a, or economics? Two of the most insanely neurotically just useless subjects that people go on and on and on about, and words mean nothing at the end of the day. How is there not this niche for a show that just hangs out and breaks down science? Uh, you know, a couple hours a week. Uh, it well, seems and like... you could very easily, you know, cut to a package that's on location somewhere. You know, like if you're talking about some sort of environmental impact, you could cut to a part of the San Francisco Bay or mm -hmm. um, cut to the woods or to a zoo or anything. Yeah. I mean, we're lucky in that we are actually in a great location for that. No, California has every. Climate. Yeah. Yeah. Everything within yeah. a short drive. We have desert. We have snow-capped mountains. We have ocean beaches. All right, I'm gonna go away now. Desert plane. <laughs> this is kidding. Okay. All right. Okay. Good night. This is Good night, Good much night, too Claire. much. But okay. before you go, before wait, wait, before let's, we go though, let's think about it. I'm moving. We, I'm gonna have a better we? office space that does not involve mm -hmm. childcare in it when in my new place. Great. Yes. Oh, so yeah. can we can we agree to pursue? I'm gonna say, can do you have this information that I emailed you about this? Yes. Uh, can it. you send it to Blair and have her do her investigation footwork thing? Yeah. I will drive my butt over there. <laughs> and actually, if you drive your butt over there, beer. you'll be exactly you'll be passing by the exact location where that beer is located. Yeah. This will work out perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is available as a podcast. I'm hanging up. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho.